I hope this works well, Adam. Adam, if this is um, if this is not coming through well, just uh, cut me off, okay? Okay, sounds good. Have you shared your sound? If there's sound, yeah. is it sharing my sound or not? Scientists. Yep, we can hear it. On an unprecedented expedition in a largely untouched remote area in the Canadian Yukon. Our goal to map out organic matter dynamics related to permafrost degradation in the Peel watershed. We covered 800 kilometers, most of it by canoe and some of it on foot, and we managed to sample 208 tributaries and 26 main channel locations. With 70 biogeochemical parameters analyzed, we gained a different perspective on Arctic watersheds dominated by permafrost landscapes. Right. So, oh, my computer is now really struggling, so it's making a lot of noise. I hope it's not uh, too bad on your side of uh, the internet connection. Um, so yeah, my name is, uh, as Adam said, Nick Spachins. I'm from Amsterdam, and I uh, was lucky enough to be on this uh, Peel expedition, on the Peel River expedition, uh, to um, for my PhD to investigate the uh, or organic matter, dissolved organic matter dynamics uh, in in permafrost permafrost landscapes. So. This is a project that falls within the context of the Nunatari project. And um, this is also where my PhD is funded from. And Nunatari focuses on quantifying the impact of permafrost degradation in the, in the Pan-Arctic region, and also the impacts on, um, on human life there. So the Peel River watershed is a medium-sized watershed in, uh, in the Canadian Arctic, in, in the Yukon. And as you can see here on this uh, map, it's indicated in red. It's almost completely covering um, continuous permafrost landscape. And this is also why we chose this watershed because, um, yeah, because we're interested in permafrost degradation and permafrost degradation is really happening on this boundary of uh, where the continuous permafrost is kind of pushed away by uh, more warmer climates uh, and discontinuous permafrost is moving northward. Um, so looking a bit, little bit more closely here, this is the watershed and in red we see all the sub watersheds, uh, sub catchments that we sampled along the way. Uh, and then the dots are showing measurements of electro, uh, electrical conductivity conductivity along the main stem that we or the traje trajectory that we paddled basically. Um, so the goal here was to sample whatever happened in the stream, so in the main channel and also the inputs from from those um, tributaries uh, all the way from the headwaters to the outlets of the Peel River here in the north where it enters the Mackenzie River. And what we can see already from this uh, first measurements of uh, EC is that there's quite a drastic change um, about here, which is where the Peel turns north along the Peel Plateau. And um, yeah, I will explain to you later why this is such a uh, rapid change. We were um, there in a very dry summer. So here you can see it. Uh, a bunch of uh, time series of years of discharge at the outlet at Fort McPherson in the north. Um, and you can see that the blue line, which is the year uh, where we were there, it's 2019, is really on the, on the lower side, especially the period where we were sampling is really one of the driest times um, on record so far. And this was also clearly uh, uh, noticeable when we were there in the field. There were forest fires all around us all the time and the water level was extremely low. So sometimes it was really hard to, um, to, to move forward. Uh, and many of the tributaries that we intended to sample initially, they were dry. So that was also a challenge. Oh. So then um, 
here's a plot of uh, the DUC concentrations along the main stem and also from all the tributaries. It's a bit of a messy plot. Um, but the most important thing here is that the small round dots, or actually all the round dots, are, are um, tributary rivers that enter the main stem. And the square dots are the main stem samples. And you can see there's really a large for, uh, variability in the DUC concentration, especially for the tributary streams. And yeah, we see that uh, the main stem has more or less, on this scale at least, a more or less constant uh, uh, DUC concentration along the sampling period. So here's a more zoomed in um, image or, or a graph of the main stem samples. And actually you can see then that it does increase over the distance of the river. And there's a quite striking jump here from uh, below to, to above to right uh, about 300 kilometers downstream from the headwaters. And that's where the Ogilvy River comes in. And there you can already see that just one river with a different kind of landscape behind it can have a huge impact on, uh, on what, what uh, amount of dissolved organic carbon is put into the river, but also presumably the type of organic matter that's put in. Um, so we are looking at the landscape and uh, in the, the relationship between the, the, the catchment landscape and uh, the processes that occur in the landscape and, and the DUC uh, quantity and quality, so the degradability, for instance, of, uh, of uh, dissolved organic matter. And one of the things that I want to show here is that we can already see that, for instance, evaporation plays a role are, well, not evaporation itself, but evaporation can hint towards um, uh, a different kind of process influencing the DOC concentration. So this is a, a plot of two water isotopes. For those of you familiar with water, water isotopes, this is a very uh, recognizable plot. If not, I'm sorry, it's, this is the way you plot water isotopes usually. Uh, and then the line is the, the uh, local meteoric water line. So that's where you expect um, uh, data to plot along. And then here, um, uh, I also kind of clearly show it with this, uh, with this arrow. You see points that are deviating from that isotopic uh, line because of evaporation. And by the color, uh, you can see they have a higher uh, DUC concentration. So this hints towards, okay, there's some process going on. In, this, uh, in those catchments that has uh, to do with evaporation and it results in higher DC concentration. And then if we plot it with a different color for the slope of those watersheds, we see that those watersheds also have very low slopes. So, okay, that's actually maybe quite obvious then. Low slopes, a lot of evaporation. This is probably uh, uh, watersheds where there are a lot of lakes and maybe marshes and just simply uh, wetlands where a lot of leaching of um, organic matter can happen into the uh, water column. So yeah, average watershed slope is definitely a good predictor of DOC, as you can see in this plot. Um, so the only striking thing here is that if you look at the electrical connectivity on top of that, we see that there are some outliers here that are actually quite high in their DOC still and also quite high in their electrical connectivity. And this kind of comes back to what I started with before. So along the Peel Plateau, um, there is a lot of slumping going on. Uh, if you remember from the first slide, there is a lot of, um, uh, there's a, a much higher electrical connectivity there measured in the, in the main stem. And this is probably because of um, a lot of slumping activity and erosion going on on the Peel Plateau uh, because of degrading permafrost. And now we are really interested in how does that affect the DOC concentration and the uh, DOM um, uh, characteristics in, 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 the, in the main stem. Um, so this is still work in progress. Uh, there is uh, some literature already showing that uh, uh, retrogressive, retrogressive, retrogressive thought slumps um, tend to temper the dissolved organic carbon delivery to streams, um, like this uh, paper from Steve Coquel and uh, Cara Lutifer and Suzanne Tank. 
Um, but uh, yeah, we are not entirely sure how those uh, extra inputs of organic um, of uh, uh, of soil into the water column um, change the type of DOC and the type of DOM that is still flowing further downstream. So this has to do with sorption and uh, uh, desorption. Now to what we want to do is to try and how am I with time by the way? Um, Still a little bit to go, but yeah. How, how much is a little bit? Because I don't have a timer here. Oh, I can't hear you. You're muted. Anyway, so okay, that's this is a um, so so we know that slumps have an effect on the dissolved organic matter in in the stream. Oh, um, now what we want to do is to try and see on the large scale how much slumping is going on in each of these catchments where we have uh, taken samples and see if we can somehow link the slumping activity to the particulates and dissolved organic matter uh, quality and quantity. Um, so this we can do with trend images of, uh, of the landscape. This is based on Landsat imagery. Um, and that if you look at the three bands, you can clearly see if you have a time series of, of, of those uh, uh, images, you can clearly see where, what kind of changes have taken place. And when you look at the slump, it looks like that. Uh, basically the blue means it has become wetter and um, the red becomes, it has become more um, uh, drier and yellow has become more bare soil. Green has become a bit more vegetated. So with this, oh, with this uh, kind of simple technique, we can identify where slumping is occurring uh, and also quantify that and then link that to what we measured in the streams. Um, so yeah, we're still working on that. Um, one of the things that is kind of uh, popping up as a question from my side is, okay, those slumps, they, they uh, provide um, mineral surface area, basically, in the, in the form of uh, suspended solids that go into the stream. But how does that actually sorb uh, organic, dissolved organic matter? And there seems to be some sort of a um, trend in what type of DOM is sorbed and what not. So, um, oh, for instance, if you look at uh, SUVA, um, the specific UV absorbance at uh, 254 uh, nanometers, it's a proxy for the aromaticity of organic matter. We see uh, a, a slight trend in uh, in in those square uh, <laughs> square um, dots, that the higher the uh, uh, suspended solids are, uh, are in the in the main stem, the also higher the the aromaticity of that organic matter, dissolved organic matter is. So that sounds obviously like gibberish and quite complex, but what it could hint to us is that this extra input of um, uh, mineral surface is actually taking away dissolved organic matter that is uh, uh, easily sorbed and it's leaving in the water column this more aromatic um, type of uh, uh, orga uh, dissolved organic matter, which could have implications on, on, on the ecosystem, for instance. Well, we're trying to figure all this kind of stuff out. As I said, uh, I only started working with this data recently um, because I have so many other things to do. Uh, so yeah, basically the way forward from here is to classify the watersheds based on, on those landscape uh, characteristics. So we'll look at the slumping activity, but also other um, vegetation indices, for instance, uh, and uh, other uh, geomorpholo geom geomorphological um, properties. And then we want to somehow start predicting if a certain uh, watershed has those characteristics, then we can expect this type of DOM coming out. And, and we want to be able to apportion sources uh, within those catchments and quantify how much we can expect from what type of landscape. 
Um, yeah, so more about that hopefully uh, in the coming year with a nice publication and a little bit more exciting results. But uh, yeah, keep tuned for that. So that's it. I would like to thank all uh, people who have been on the expedition and uh, helped out with the logistics, as well as the institu institutions, as you can see below, like uh, AVE, for instance, and GFZ, ETH, GTU, CPOS, and uh, the University uh, of um, Amsterdam, of course, my own university. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm not sure if we're doing that now right away or if we should do that later. Yeah, so if there's any questions for Nick, we can pass the questions along to him. So you can send it in the chat and we can read it out for you, or you can just unmute yourself and ask. Um, I have a question right away. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very nice, very nice uh, visuals, um, especially. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, you said that you will integrate your findings into a model and um, will your model concentrate more on the DOM uh, and, it, and um, everything you told us about now or also like what it means for the export of the DOM to the near shore area, for instance, because uh, eventually it will end up there, right? <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, so my my phd is focusing on small arctic watersheds in permafrost areas basically so that means you can look at all uh like at various stages within a catchment and and if you just if you go into a river and you take an upstream uh, area you have a small catchment basically so the goal of this study is not so much to look at the export into the arctic ocean but more to get a grip on how 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 much for friability there is in catchments maybe it turns out i mean i'm not entirely sure yet but maybe it turns out that um it doesn't matter that much and that the most of those catchments have kind of uh although they are different they have more or less the same kind of export properties um so the idea is to yes to model also um but we're not going to model necessarily um exports into the arctic ocean if the, so is that no that's not completely answering your question i have the feeling no 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 it's fine uh, like i just wanted um to see what what you have what it planned kind of yeah yeah so yeah I have to uh, confess that we're trying out multiple things at the moment. So for instance, um, Eric Young is a student, uh, master students with master student with us. He is now really going into the Peel watershed specifically and trying to model uh, this uh, sorption, desorption to uh, um, mineral surfaces and try to relate that to slumping activity. So that's very specific. Um, but myself, I will uh, more. I will more integrate this uh, into my larger scale catchment study and just um, add it to the list of types of catchments and what kind of export properties they have for DOC and DOM. Um, that's also hopefully going to contribute to a bigger modeling exercise. But that modeling will be more of a uh, not so much um, a process model, but more like a, a statistical model to just predict fluxes based on uh, data. Thank you. C can I ask a question? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, really interesting. Um, is is Presumably your data is all from the one trip in the one summer. Is that right? Yeah. That's true. So how are you going to reconcile the, the dry conditions uh, in a statistical model? Like, because we know slump activity, you know, if it's a wet year, slump activity is much higher. So I'm just wondering yeah. how you might get around that. Yeah, this is a, this is a very good question. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to put it in on the heap, I think you know so we have already gathered a lot of data from 
other regions and other um uh, or are you, are you talking about the large scale model or the this the um the the more peel watershed dedicated model that i just explained uh, i guess either really cuz if it's all mm -hmm. from the same year um it'll be the same issue if it's a slump if there's a lot of slump affected watersheds um within your area yeah well, I guess initially it will just be a side note because we can't really correct for it in any way, I think. Um, ideally, we would go not another time uh, and, and sample different types of years. And I'm, I'm sure that there are some data sets from earlier. Uh, and, and then I think that with the Landsat data, we can get quite a long time series of where slumping uh, has occurred and where it's more... Uh, um, more or less stable so i hope that we can somehow reconstruct some some of that past data as well but, uh or not the data but uh, some of the link the earlier data with uh with um with that but i'm yeah i think it's just a, uh it's just a kind of given that we have this year and the good thing is is that the slumping activity is a multi-year uh, process so you um uh you you do, we, we don't have that much um like doubt of, of of any really like rapid like new slums occurring and yeah i i actually i don't think we can really correct for it that's the short answer <laughs> yeah but it's an awesome uh, if, you have, if you have suggestions I, i'd be really happy to hear it actually I, I, I mean, yeah, maybe we could talk about it another time, but I, yeah, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head how I'd correct for it, but I know that, you know, when, when it's a rainier season, then uh, there's way more, um, there's way more sediment being transported downstream and in dry seasons, the slumps can actually sort of uh, stop or, you know, the export is way, way less. Yeah. Well, the good thing is that we, we do have, 14C, uh, so carbon dating data also on the particulates fraction and on the dissolved fraction. So hopefully that will give us some insight in what fraction of the uh, particulate uh, matter is also coming from old sources, so pr uh, presumably from slumping. And then I think it would be more or less uh, educated guessing that in a year, that is whether we would have more of this uh, sorption going on. So, yeah. so I just it's, want to say that's an awesome trip, and I love that 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 type of study. That's super cool. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I like to. I'm gonna yeah. have to jump in so we can get to the next speaker. So thank you very much, Nick and Brendan and Charlotte, for a very nice discussion on the Peel Plateau and some dissolved organic matter characteristics. So Nick, yes, if I can get please. you to stop sharing your screen, we'll move on to our second speaker. So next we're gonna be hearing from Nick Node from the University of Lethbridge, and he is a master student in geography and the environment, and will be telling us about surface-based temperature inversions. So Nick, take it away. All right, thank you, Adam. Um, yeah. So let's jump right into it. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking to you about the surface-based temperature inversion characteristics in Northwestern Canada from Radiosan data between 1990 and 2016. So this is some research that me and my co-authors did um, that are listed on this page um, at the University of Lethbridge here to, um, and we, we've just recently submitted this is a paper to the Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology. So first of all, what is a surface-based temperature inversion? Well, on this slide, we see a couple of figures that help describe this. We have elevation on the y-axis and air temperature on the x-axis. So we're looking at temperature gradients um, over elevation change. Um, so normally, air temperature cools as you increase with elevation. Um, as you climb the mountain, it gets colder. That's a typical pattern we see. Um, but when a surface-based inversion is present, air temperature actually warms um, with increased elevation. So those lapse rates go from normal to being inverted. So that warming air temperature until you reach the top of the surface-based inversion layer 
Um, and then it can revert, those lapse rates can reverse back to normal cooling with increased elevation. But an important thing to look at is at the top of the inversion layer, we're seeing the warmest part of the elevation transect um, in this case. Uh, but normally that would be in the valley bottom. So we're going to look at why this is important to permafrost distribution. Um, so here on this slide, we have uh, conceptual diagrams of what is going on in some Yukon Canada valleys where surface-based inversions dominate through so much of the year that we see uh, surface lapse rates gently inverted uh, throughout the year on an annual average. Um, and that's at and below tree line as the top of the surface-based inversion layer falls at that point. So that thermal belt or that warmest part of the mountain actually occur can occur around tree line in these cases. Um, rather than being in the valley bottom, as is observed in many mountainous areas around the world. Um, so this means that permafrost probability in some of these areas can be lowest around tree line rather than in valley bottom. And this is kind of a different uh, permafrost distribution pattern than is observed in many areas. So Basically, the surface space inversions are shaping um, that permafrost distribution and how it changes with future climate warming. We have thaw up from tree line up the mountain as well as down into the valley bottom um, due to these surface based inversions altering uh, temperature patterns along the elevation transects. Um, so this is known as bidirectional spatial loss. So overall, these are important things to understand um, in these mountainous high latitude mountainous areas of Yukon where these surface-based inversions dominate throughout the year. So the objectives of my research here um, center around those ideas. Um, so first it's to quantify and explain spatial and temporal patterns of surface-based characteristics, inversion characteristics in Northwest Canada, um, to quantify the impact of surface-based inversions on cooling surface air temperatures, at annual and seasonal scales and to conceptualize how the, this impacts permafrost distribution at each location based on surrounding topography. So the study area we're in, we're in Northwestern Canada and we need to select locations with archived radioson data from 1990 to 2016. And there's five locations across Northwest Canada, including Whitehorse Yukon, Fort Nelson, British Columbia, Fort Smith, Norman Wells, and Inuvik, Northwest Territories. So these kind of represent some different areas. We have some mountain valley locations at Whitehorse, Fort Nelson, and Norman Wells, as well as kind of a Delta Plains area, Inuvik, and kind of a flatland forested area in Fort Smith. So what is the methodology? Let's play this video um, of a radioson sensor being released attached to a weather balloon. So that goes up through the atmosphere, taking meteorological uh, measurements. And that's released twice a day, once during the daytime and once at the nighttime. And from these readings, we look at the air temperature readings and see what the lapse rates are. And when there's a surface-based inversion present, uh, that's that data is collected from the archived radioson data. And we, know, we can know the inversion depth um, how deep those inversions are at any given reading, um, what the strength or temperature change across that inversion is, and how frequent across a period of time those uh, surface-based inversions are. And so we take those traditional inversion characteristics that I just described, and we created a new inversion characteristic called inversion impact. Um, and this conceptualizes the cooling impact of surface space inversions on surface air temperatures. Um, so again, we've got um, lapse rates here, temperature with altitude um, to describe how we did this. Um, so we need to see what projected surface warming there might be uh, if there was no surface space inversion present. So if the lapse rates continued at that environmental lapse rate or minus 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer, what would the temperature be at the surface? And then this projected surface warming from where the temperature is at the top of the inversion layer 
is added to inversion strength to give us an inversion magnitude. So what is, that's the difference between temperature um, observed when a surface space inversion is present at the surface and what it could be if there was just normal lapse rates through the whole atmosphere. So this magnitude is then multiplied by frequency and these are done on the day <clears throat> and night values and then averaged out um, to give us inversion impact and that's to give it kind of a temporal aspect and see what through time what the inversion impact is. And this allows us to look at spatial and temporal variability um, and what the implications might be on surface air temperatures and subsequent permafrost distribution. So what are some results? Um, we have here the inversion impact um, seasonally and annually across uh, the study period from 1990 to 2016. So that's the average inversion impact in those periods of time. And we see that inver inversion impact is highest at Fort Nelson um, with Inuvik being uh, the second highest and Whitehorse being the lowest inversion impact. Um, and we also see that in the winter time inversion impact is much greater. Um, and this makes sense as these surface-based inversions can develop and persist through much of the winter as there's little to no solar radiation to warm the surface and mix them out. Um, and so what sort of influence does this have on permafrost? Well, we look at the annual inversion impact at Fort Nelson, for example, and we see that the mean annual air temperature is minus 0 0.1 degrees Celsius, so around zero there. And we're seeing that 5.2 degrees Celsius is the inversion impact annually. Um, so very much so these surface-based inversions being present are driving the temperature cold enough for our sporadic permafrost distribution in Fort Nelson in these lower lying areas. Um, and it's important to understand what the change might be across the topography of this area of this inversion impact. And that's what I'll talk about next here. Um, I've got some hips metric curves of 25 kilometer uh, radii surrounding each of the study sites that we have, each of the five. And so on these curves, we have elevation on the y-axis um, and the percentage of land area at or below that elevation uh, on the x-axis. So high mountainous areas, very little of the area is land surface areas in that area. And then at the valley bottoms, um, all the, or nearly all the land surface areas at or below that um, elevation. So we look and we have three mountainous areas and that's Whitehorse, um, Fort Nelson and Norman Wells. And so also on these graphs, we have these dashed lines that represent the position or the elevation from which the <clears throat> radioson sensor is released. Um, and this is important to look at because if it's released from kind of a higher point in the land surface, we may be missing some of the um, inversion impact as it's not released from the lower lowest point. So we looked at that, but the most important thing I wanna look at is the dotted line. And that represents the top of the surface-based inversion layer on average, on an annual average. So as we look at that, we can see that um, at around that location, there is little to no uh, inversion impact. Um, and this may actually be a thermal belt in these cases. Um, so in the case of Whitehorse, we've got nearly 50% of the land surface surrounding that station is at or above that surface-based inversion layer. Um, so that means that possibly that inversion impact is absent or greatly reduced at that location. And so looking at what permafrost distribution is being influenced at these thermal belt locations is important moving forward and just how much things are being shaped by the presence of these dominant surface-based inversions and any changes to them with future climate change has implications on permafrost distribution. And then these are uh, Fort Smith um, and Inuvik, flatter areas. The surface-based inversion layer uh, on average is much higher than any of the land surface. So there's kind of less of that topography effect on the changes in inversion impact so what are the implications of this research? Well, we conceptualized um, the impact of 
uh, inversions on surface air temperatures. And we found that there is significant impacts um, and this can influence permafrost distribution. And that it's important to look at how these surface-based inversions and their influence may change with climate change. And also this new inversion impact variable, highly recommend for future research on surface-based inversions, particularly with respects to how they're influencing permafrost in areas. Um, I'd just like to, to acknowledge uh, these groups for their support, um, as well as the First Nations groups where we, their traditional territory where the radio sound sensors are released from, and also my co-authors um, and all the work they put into helping with the research and putting together the paper. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. If we can't get to them all, here's my email. Uh, just shoot me an email and I can get back to you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nick, for a really interesting presentation. So we have about three minutes for questions, if anybody in the audience would like to ask one or ask in the chat. Yeah, I have a question, just a, just a short one. Uh, probably I just missed something, but I just uh, have a general question. Uh, am I right that the influence of the inversions is uh, generally higher in the more continental uh, and more like uh, in, in the more con con continental points and in the more uh, like low surfaces in the mountains? Uh, is it works here also as a general rule uh, of our, I mean, of your region. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it does fall into that pattern where um, Whitehorse is the closest to the Pacific Ocean um, and seemingly had the lowest uh, inversion impact. And normally from what research has shown in this area, the further like continental and inland you go, um, the more you're having, and the surprise was Fort Nelson, which had such a high inversion impact because it was a little bit further south, it was the furthest south site. So that's kind of an interesting thing that I'm looking into. Um, but for the most part, yes, the continental areas and the mountain valley locations are seeing significant cold pooling and mm -hmm. inversion development. Thank you. And can I also ask another fat, brief question? Uh, and what, so you said, you mentioned that uh, the influence, I mean, that the influence of the uh, inversions is higher in winter. I mean, the amount of, in, of the temperature is higher, but what does it mean for the permafrost temperature or to the uh, freezing? It, it, is it, uh, can we compare these factors? I mean, in terms of winter cooling of permafrost? Yeah, yeah, and that's something that um, is definitely something worth looking into because uh, seasonally, obviously, with such a great difference, um, it's going to be most influential during that freezing season um, and cooling things. And I guess that would make snow cover and things like that very important to understand in relation to this phenomena because of most of the impact actually occurring in the the winter time. So I would imagine very much so seasonally, it, it'd be important to understand what the difference between its influence on like cooling the permafrost through the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and because during the thaw season, it's kind of not as prevalent. Yeah, thank you. Good questions, Vasily. Those were the two questions pretty much to an exact wording that I had for my two questions. Uh, so if there are any others from the audience, we can take those. And if not, we can move to our next speaker. Going once. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nick. That was a fantastic presentation. Thanks. So last but not least, we have Roxanne, who I'm going to thank and publicly apologize to because there was a time change in Europe this weekend and I emailed her that the thing was at 12 and then I emailed her this morning saying, just kidding, it's at 11, can you please come present? So thank you for 
your understanding because time zones are hard and I apparently don't do well with them. So uh, um, our last speaker is Roxanne Frappier and I believe she's doing a PhD in geography at the University of Ottawa uh, and is actually also one of the national representatives for Pern North America. So if anybody here from North America any or has any questions for Pern, you can reach out to Roxanne. So Roxanne, you can take it away. Thank you. Okay, so can you see it full screen now? Yep, we sure can. Okay, great. So, okay, thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to present some results of investigations of ice wedge polygons in central Yukon. And these results are going to be published in an article in a permafrost and periglacial processes in the coming weeks, hopefully. So keep an eye out for these if you want more information on the methods and results. So this research is taking place right here in central Yukon in the Tombstone Territorial Park, which we like to call TTP. Um, so it's about 45 kilometers north of Dawson City, and it's an important transportation corridor. So as you can see here, it is traversed by the Dempster Highway, which is an important transportation infrastructure in the Yukon. Um, it is very highly elevated. So about 95% of the area is located above one kilometer above sea level. Um, it has three main north-south oriented river valleys. So we have the Shandindu River Valley here, uh, the Blackstone River here, and the East Blackstone River here, which close to the climate zone. So it has uh, short, cool summers and long, cold winters. Characterized by alpine tundra, of stunted black spruce and dwarf birch and willow. And based on the vegetation, elevation and climate, permafrost is most likely widespread in the area. There are signs of permafrost and ground ice uh, presence and degradation in the park. So we have thaw slumps, active layer detachment slides, pingles. It's yet distribution of permafrost and ground ice. And the first step in establishing that is um, to investigate ice wedge polygons. So why are we looking at ice wedge polygons? So first, it is one of the most widespread surface feature, not only in the It is highly susceptible to degradation and lo local subsidence. So as you can see here um, along the troughs, uh, this is where you find the ice wedges and they're located very close to the surface. So any slight change in um, surface conditions or climate conditions can lead to their degradation. Landscape degradation because ice wedge polygons. Degradation contributes to the formation of open gullies, um, especially through thermal erosion. And they also have cumulative effects on the landscape. So there also changes the vegetation composition over time. Um, and their degradation can also lead to solutes and nutrients uh, released to the environment and can also make stocks of soil carbon um, available to microbial decomposition and so it can contribute to the global carbon cycle. And so basically quantifying the distribution of ice wedge polygons and the wedge ice volume at a regional scale such as a territorial park is essential to assess the vulner vulnerability of permafrost landscapes. Um, just some uh, theory um, on ice wedge polygons before I go any further. So ice wedge polygons cycle through uh, different stages of development. So first we have the undegraded or have a mixture of high centered and low centered polygons, such as this one, which are often inundated. Um, then you have the initial degradation stage where you'll start to get some uh, thawing of the transient layer, some settling and some greening, and then you transition to high centered polygons instead of low centered polygons. Then in the advanced degradation stage, um, usually you'll get uh, 
some water in the troughs, as you can see here, um, and further degradation of uh, the transit layer and ice wedge. And then in the stabilization stage, um, we have inundated uh, polygons intersections. So the water is being redistributed from the troughs to uh, the intersections like this. And then you'll get an abundance of water tolerant plants and some permafrost aggradation, um, which is why you'll find often some ice lenses right above the ice wedge in uh, the permafrost. But ba basically, um, Another thing that's important to note is that newly developing ice wedge polygons will have a random orthogonal network. So it means that the cracks where the ice wedges form open at random and often at um, 90 degrees uh, angles. And then as uh, other cracks open and other ice wedges form, um, you'll get uh, more of a regular um, pattern with more hexagonal angles. And what's important here basically is that the development stage of ice wedge polygons can be inferred when we look at the microtopography, the water level, the vegetation type, and the network of ice wedge polygons. So for the methods here, um, first of all, for the distribution of ice wedge polygons, we manually delineated ice wedge polygons zones from high resolution satellite imagery. And then we compared with different landscape factors, so elevation, slope, surficial deposits, to see if the ice wedges develop uh, preferentially in association with different landscape factors. Second thing we did is we looked at the different morphometric parameters. So first we use the watershed segmentation method, which is um, a method that is based on the hydrology tool set in ArcGIS, where basically you treat your each individual polygon as a watershed. Um, and then it gives you an outline of each individual polygon in your um, in your polygon zone. And then we use these outlines to measure different uh, types of morphometric parameters. So polygon size, the length of the troughs, the relative depth of the troughs, the polygon angles. And we also did a spatial point pattern analysis, which basically gives you um, a measure of how random or regular the network is. We also use the out, these outlines to uh, estimate the wedge ice volume, but I won't be talking about that today because 12 minutes is not enough to cover everything. But um, lastly, we did some statistical analysis. So we performed an analysis of variance um, among the different parameters just to see if the sites were statistically different or similar. And this was performed in R. So for the results, First, we found that ice wedge polygons occupy 2.6% of the TTP, and they're all concentrated, as you can see here, within the lower reaches of the Blackstone and East Blackstone River Valleys. As for the distribution relative to surficial ge geology, we found that 80% of ice wedge polygons developed in glacial deposits, while the remainder uh, developed in alluvial plains and woody sedge beet. Um, we also normalized the relative frequency of the polygons by the relative frequency of the landscape in order to see if um, polygons preferentially develop in, a, in association with certain landscape factors. So basically in that normalized frequency graph here, anything above one means that um, polygons preferentially uh, develop in this this type of landscape factor. So we found that they preferentially develop in woody sedge peat and glacial fluvial deposits by factors of 10 to 15, and in glacial deposits in alluvium by factors of four to seven. We also looked at uh, this, the distribution relative, relative to terrain factors. Um, so as you can see here, we find that they develop uh, preferentially in two uh, different elevation ranges, so between 995 and 1,045 meters above sea level, and 1,065 and 1,135 meters. Um, we also found that they develop preferentially on slopes of one, of one or less by factors of eight to five. So as for the morphometry, so we selected six sites. So we had three sites that are located in the East Blackstone River, 
valley, so where the Dempster Highway runs, and three sites along the Blackstone River Valley. And I won't be going through the data for each site because that would be very tedious, but basically we looked at the location and the types of deposits. We look at the types of polygons. So are they high centered polygons or low centered polygons? And we looked at the vegetation composition, both in the polygon centers and troughs. And then we took the outlines that we did here and we looked at the network. So uh, this is here is the results of the um, spatial point pattern analysis. Basically everything that falls within that gray envelope here is random. So it's a random pattern. And everything that falls under that gray envelope, envelope here is considered a regular pattern. Uh, we also looked at um, the relative depth of the troughs and the angles that form the polygons. And lastly, we looked at the size, so the diameter, perimeter, um, and surface area of each individual polygons. And then that gave us um, data like this, and we tested for statistical similarity using the ANOVA test. Um, so this is a lot of data, but basically what stands out is that site BR tree right here, which is the only site that is found in reed age glacial deposits, is statistically uh, different from all the other five sites, whereas all the other five sites developed in Holocene age uh, alluvial and colluvial deposits, and these are all statistically similar. Um, so basically, at site BR3, the polygons are larger and they form a majority of orthogonal angles. Also, in terms of spatial point pattern analysis, this, the polygons at site BR3 um, fall mostly within the regular pattern, where, whereas the other, one, the other ones fall mainly within the random pattern or intermediate pattern. And so what are the implications of these results? Basically, what we found is that um, the ice wedge occurrence is much lower than in other regions um, in the Arctic. And why is that? It's because the distribution of ice wedge polygons in our study area is constrained by hill slope processes and the hydrological network. So basically, the upper and middle reaches of the fluvial valleys are narrow. Um, and the hill slopes often expose bedrock or they're covered only by thin colluviated sediments. And that prevents the development of ice, wedge, ice wedges. Whereas the lower reaches of the river valleys are uh, wide. They have low gradient meandering channels um, and they're characterized by high sediment, oof, already, okay. High sediment uh, aggradation rates. So basically the lower reaches are covered by thick blankets of sediments and that um, allowed for the development of ice wedge polygons, at least uh, since the middle of the Holocene. Um, another important thing is we found that sediment properties and age have different influences. So um, I'm gonna go through this quickly, but basically uh, the Holocene age alluvial deposits, um, the ice wedge polygons that developed in Holocene age alluvial deposits were similar to other, other uh, continental Canadian Arctic regions, whereas the ones that developed in reed age glacial deposits were 2.5 to 3 times larger. And then another study done in the TTP found ice wedges buried um, about 3 meters below the surface that developed in reed age glacial deposits. So our conclusion is that these uh, ice wedge polygons um, such as those that we find at BR3 are probably contemporaneous to these buried ice wedges. And so they're probably in disequilibrium with Holocene climate. Uh, we also found that the only site that developed an organic material, which is site kilometer 93, is the only site that revealed a random, a completely random pattern. So the other ones were either intermediate, uh, so with a portion of uh, the cumulative fre frequency falling within um, the regular pattern or being completely random. And so the spatial pattern, so the spatial network of polygon is more closely influenced by the nature of the substrate, whereas the size of the polygons is more closely influenced by the age of the substrate. And then one last thing I want to cover is that um, we were able to determine that our sites are all are at least in four different uh, development stages. So uh, we have some developing 
at polygons. We have some that are degrading either in the initial or advanced degradation stages, and we have some that are in the stabilization stage. And basically, despite the fact that we have four different development stages, they are all statistically similar in terms of morphometric parameters. So except for site BR3, all of these stages are statistically similar in terms of size, um, surface area, and perimeter. And so that suggests that uh, ice wedge, the evolution of uh, polygons to the different stages may not always be influenced by, may not always influence the morphometric char characteristics of polygons. However, when we compare these different stages with the um, a spatial point pattern analysis, we see that there is uh, a clear association. So the developing uh, polygons were random. The degrading polygons were in inter intermediate uh, pattern. And the stabilized polygons were all in the regular pattern. So the different stages of development seem to be associated with the regularity of the polygon network. Finally, um, some just a general conclusion, the study was able to provide insight on the different morphometric and spatial pattern methods that can be used to interpret ice wedge polygons development stage and wedge ice volume. And again, keep an eye out for the article if you would like more information. And that's it for me. Awesome, thank you so much, Roxanne. That was really interesting. And I'm sure there's a, a lot of ice wedge experts in the group that would like to ask you a few questions. So any questions from the audience, you can just unmute and go ahead. And maybe I would like to ask you, um, were there any other examples of permafrost related features than, than only uh, ice wedges? Thermocarst? Uh, Thermocarst features? Is that? Yeah, uh, permafrost related features like uh, like um, stripes or or something like this. Um, no, so I, we didn't identify any other types of sorted uh, stripes or things like that. So even on the hill slopes, we couldn't identify any other types of evidence of um, of uh, ice rich permafrost or uh, ground ice. But there are some thaw slumps. Uh, there are some thermocarst lakes. Um, so we know that the permafrost across the, the park is most likely very ice rich. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Because if not, I do have one. So one of your figures, you showed uh, the relationship between elevation and the distribution and abundance of ice wedge polygons. So I'm not super familiar with ice wedges, but is this something that you expected? And what, what's the link between elevation and ice wedges? So um, in terms of elevation, I think the, the main constraint really is the slope. So um, I didn't show this, but we, we have a, a elevation profile of the river valleys. And as you go up in elevation, the slope also increases. So it, I think it's, it's, it's much more a result of the slope than of the elevation. Yeah. OK, perfect. Thanks. We, we can talk about a parameter about uh, for, for um, degrees in slope, because, because uh, about, about this uh, slope, we can find uh, these, these features. Yes, exactly. Normally. So normally. Think, normally. Mm -hmm. So th that's the thing too, I, I didn't touch on that, but we, we did do some estimation of wedge ice volume. And we know that this is a minimal value because there could be ice wedges on hill slopes, but it just, it doesn't result in the typical polygonal network surface expression. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's a minimum value for sure. Yeah, are there... oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, probably. I missed something also, but you, your on your final slide, you said that uh, developing polygons there it just cracked randomly. Am I right? And what does it mean? I mean, uh, does it mean that the cracking process goes using the uh, weak 
soil. I, I mean, what, what does it mean physically that it goes randomly? Um, or uh-huh. yeah, go ahead. So the, the crack, the cracks where the ice wedges form, they they open at random at first. And then as they become, the polygons become divided into secondary and tertiary polygons, Mm -hmm. then it becomes more organized sort of. So so it doesn't mean that just the first crack is random and after that it goes, it, it just structurizes. Yes, and that's why we can infer the age or the development stage of the, the net of the ice wedges from the network. Yeah, gotcha. Su- super, super interesting. Uh, and do you know the uh, paper from Mikhail Konevsky and Yuri Shur, who work in University of Alaska for banks? I would highly recommend you to compare your work with them because they also create their own. Uh, yeah, I, I can share it in the chat because they also yeah. uh, just create sort of a scheme for the degradation and stabilization of the ice wedges, but in Alaska, and it will be interesting just to compare uh, your vision and their. Yeah, I'm sure I've probably read it, but yes, if you want to share it. I'll share it with you. It's super interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, if there are no other questions, we're a little bit over time, so we can conclude the seminar. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who came and for being patient for us going seven minutes over. But uh, I think the discussion was great. So it was nice to hear from everyone. So you can give one final round of emoji applause to our our speakers in lieu of gathering in person. Um, And I also just like to say that we'll be planning one more PERN seminar. So if anybody is interested, you can submit your abstract to our Google Forms, which we sent out in our last PERN newsletter. And hopefully we will see you all at the next seminar. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, is there any deadline for it? For a uh, nope, it's, a, it's an open submission. So you can go ahead and, and submit your abstract and we'll keep an eye on it as, as we go. Have a good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world, everyone. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for organizing. It was super interesting. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.